Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome to this brand new series on pediatric dentistry. Now, pediatric dentistry is multidisciplinary in nature, and it encompasses a wide range of the other specialties. So these videos, if you're watching them after some of my other series, may provide some helpful overlap and review with some of the other sections. Now with that in mind, Pediatric dentistry is certainly not the same as adult dentistry because kids and primary teeth present some unique challenges and we need to talk about what those are. So we're going to cover a lot of great topics in this series and it's definitely one of the most requested as of recently. The board examiners combine orthodontics and pediatric dentistry into one category in their guidelines but I think it's honestly more helpful to focus on each one of those individually, so that's why I'm going to have a separate series for each of them. So that being said, like all my videos, I'm going to focus only on the highest yield things that you need to know for the board exam. My hope is that these videos will help you prepare for it and also give you a nice overview for a clinical application and general knowledge. So with that, let's get started and talk about odontogenesis, or tooth development. And this is honestly a very complex topic, but I'm excited to boil it down in the most simplified way possible for you. Now tooth development is dependent on both genetic control and also environmental factors like nutrition, trauma, infection, or even excess fluoride intake during tooth formation. And we'll talk more about these environmental factors and developmental disturbances and anomalies in the following video. So this is a really nice schematic showing the different uh, developing layers and the different stages from beginning to erupted tooth. Now we're going to talk about all of these in detail, and I'm definitely going to focus on the bud, the cap, and the bell stages which are nice to remember because each of those is corresponding to the shape that the enamel organ is assuming in each one of those stages. So let's talk about each one in detail, starting with thickening or initiation. So initiation starts six weeks in utero. And this is referring to how long the fetus has been developing in the womb. So there are a couple of layers that we have to address here. The oral epithelium is the outer layer of the developing mouth. And this has both an upper and a lower arch form. That referring to the, the upper and the lower part of the eventual and ultimate mouth. The dental lamina is a thickening of this oral epithelium and the first evidence of a forming or budding tooth. Now this image is a two-dimensional cross-section, so imagine that the thickened area is going both into the screen and coming out of the screen to create a whole row of thickened oral epithelium where individual teeth will eventually pinch off from. The ectomesenchyme is this thick underlying purple layer, and that signals the overlying oral epithelium to proliferate into the dental lamina. Now the oral epithelium and the dental lamina are both derived from the ectoderm. The ectomesenchyme is also derived from the ectoderm, but more specifically, the neural crest. It's called the ectomesenchyme because it's derived from the ectoderm indirectly, but it develops into tissue that is physiologically similar to mesenchymal tissue or mesoderm-derived tissue. Failure in this very first step can lead to major issues. Either the tooth is completely missing or we get an extra tooth. The next stage is the bud stage, and this begins eight weeks in utero, so two weeks later. Here, the dental lamina is quickly growing and invades into the underlying mesenchyme. So these proliferating areas of the dental lamina are pinching off to produce these buds, 
and these buds are called dental placodes. Now this is really important. All primary teeth and permanent molars arise directly from this dental lamina. So they look exactly as the schematic is showing here. But permanent incisors, canines, and premolars arise from their primary predecessor. So what does that mean? Well, a secondary bud pinches off from the first bud. So imagine there's a separate smaller bud coming off right around there. And that goes through the same stages from this point forward to develop the permanent teeth, except for the molars. Now, and this makes sense because these are all succedaneous teeth or teeth that eventually replace a primary tooth, whereas all of the primary teeth and the permanent molars have no teeth that they're replacing. They're the first ones in their respective regions to come into the mouth. So I find that that's the best way to remember this concept and to keep that information straight. Now, additionally, the mesenchyme is also beginning to condense underneath the bud. And that's what these uh, dark blue, dark purple dots are showing, that this tissue is starting to condense directly underneath that bud. Failure in the bud stage, again, results in congenitally missing teeth, where the budding process doesn't occur at all, or supernumerary teeth, where we have excessive budding happening. All right, next we have the cap stage, and this happens nine weeks in utero. So the cap stage is also known as proliferation, and it's when the bud continues to grow and proliferate while also differentiating into some new layers. Now each dental placode, shown here, grows and indents to form the enamel organ. So this is now called the enamel organ. And the enamel organ will ultimately create the enamel. Now we're not anywhere close to that stage yet, but just keep that in the back of your head. The enamel organ consists of, of, of a various very important layers to remember. The first is the OEE, or outer enamel epithelium. And this is the outer cell layer. So it's what I'm highlighting right here. I'll try to get these in a couple of different colors for you. The next layer is the inner enamel epithelium, and that is the inner cell layer. So that's going to be this part right there. All right, and next we have the stellate reticulum, which are the cells between the OEE and the IEE. So that's all this stuff all in here. And finally, we have the enamel knot, which are these little areas of focal thicketing. Now, I kind of covered it up, but there are these kind of points or peaks along this inner enamel epithelium that eventually determine where the cusp tips will be. And they're also the signaling centers for the developing tooth. Now, that condensed mesenchyme that we were talking about before aggregates and now it finally forms its own entity and it's called the dental papilla. So essentially the dental papilla is now wearing this enamel organ as a sort of cap. The dental papilla will ultimately create and become the dentin and the pulp. Again, as with the other things in a uh, italicized font here. That's just an ultimate goal, but we're not anywhere close to that point yet in the tooth development process. So the dental follicle is the sac that surrounds the enamel organ and the dental papilla. So you can think of it like this black outline that encircles this entire enamel organ and underlying dental papilla. So again, the dental papilla is wearing the enamel organ as its cap, and the dental follicle surrounds it all. Failure in this process could result in 
could result in congenitally missing or supernumerary teeth if it occurs early on, but more likely you're going to see a cyst, odontoma, gemination or fusion, or dens and dente, depending on the amount of cell differentiation that has occurred. All right, next we have the bell stage, and this one begins 11 weeks in utero. And there are two components or two phases in the bell stage. The first is called histo differentiation. Histo, meaning tissue, and this is where we get differentiation and transformation of those layers we were talking about into distinct cell types that'll be responsible for secreting our final tooth tissue, hence the name here. So the cells of the inner enamel epithelium differentiate into ameloblasts, whereas the cells of the dental papilla differentiate into odontoblasts, all of which are tall and columnar in shape. Now I matched the colors here. It might be a little bit hard to see. I apologize, they're very thin. But that darker tan layer is the ameloblasts, which were part of the IEE. And then this part, that kind of burgundy color, thin layer, are the odontoblasts, that outer portion of the dental papilla, right up against that IEE. So that junction right there is going to be the eventual dentin enamel junction, the, the DEJ of that tooth. Now this makes sense because ameloblasts are secreting enamel and the odontoblasts are going to be secreting dentin, which is consistent with what we saw in the previous slide. Now defects in this process of histodifferentiation can cause amelogenesis imperfecta, where you get abnormal enamel formation, you get this yellow-brown discoloration, or dentinogenesis imperfecta, where you get abnormal dentin formation, or this brown-gray discoloration. And again, this all makes sense because of what is happening during this stage. So hopefully you can draw those connections and really help to lock this into your brain. The second phase is called morpho differentiation. Morpho meaning form, structure, shape. This is where we determine the size and the shape of the eventual tooth crown. Now, of course, this is also happening simultaneously with histodifferentiation, hence why I have the same time period of 11 weeks in utero for the bell stage. So it makes sense that a failure in a stage that's all about determining shape and size are going to have shape and size abnormalities, like peg laterals, macrodontia, and a couple more that we'll talk about in our next video. So next we have apposition. Now in apposition, happening at 14 weeks in utero, first we're going to have those odontoplasts secreting a dentin matrix of collagen, which then signals the ameloblasts to secrete an enamel matrix of amelogenin. Then after the enamel starts being produced, the cervical loop jumps into the action and root development starts to take place. Now the cervical loop is where the IEE and the OEE layers meet. So that's going to be right at this point here, where that outer enamel epithelium and that inner enamel epithelium, now ameloblasts, joins together. And here's the point on this side here. So our cervical loop going circumferentially around the developing tooth bell. So this part, the cervical loop elongates and grows down. So it's growing down in this direction. And it forms an extension called Hertwig's epithelial root sheath. We'll just call it HERS for short. And this stimulates odontoblasts to secrete radicular dentin, which is dentin as part of the root. Now HERS eventually disintegrates, leaving behind little clusters of cells called the epithelial rests of malassae that stay present in the ultimate periodontal ligament. It's just a vestigial structure as part of the developing tooth. 
Now the stellate reticulum, that's this part here between the IE and the OE, collapses and deflates kind of like a popped balloon. And the outer and inner enamel epithelium meet together and lay along the top of the enamel matrix that's beginning to form. And the combination of the deflated IE and OE becomes the reduced enamel epithelium. And that kind of protects the tooth as it erupts and eventually it'll form the junctional epithelium part of the gingiva. And then what remains of the dental papilla will eventually become the pulp. Now disturbances in this step where we're getting apposition or initial laying down of these matrices you could get like uh, trauma in the in this stage. If you get trauma to a primary tooth, you could disrupt the cells while they're laying down these initial matrix layers. So say you have uh, the primary teeth are erupted in the mouth and those permanent teeth are currently going through apposition at those secondary buds. And if you knock a primary tooth, you could actually disrupt those ameloblasts, let's say, cause some ameloblast injury and this can result in localized areas of enamel hypoplasia called Turner's hypoplasia. And again, we'll talk about that more in the next video if you're curious about that. All right, and we're almost done here. Maturation is also known as calcification or mineralization. And this one takes place at various time points for different teeth, but Important to know, this is by far the longest stage of tooth development, and it involves, finally, the deposition of the ultimate enamel and dentin. Remember, in apposition, we were just kind of laying down those initial matrices, and now we're talking about transforming those into the final tooth structure. So the calcification process begins at the cusp tips and incisal edges, where those enamel knots were and proceeds in a cervical direction. Now it takes two years for a primary tooth crown on average and four to five years on average for a permanent tooth crown to complete this maturation process. And that's not even including the root. It takes quite a few more years for the root to finish developing. So this is a really, really long process. And now that explains why these disturbances uh, these defects rather are so common because the critical time period is much longer here. There's a lot more time for something to go wrong. So disturbances like localized infection and trauma can result in hypocalcification or hypomineralization. Those are those white spots. You can get um, fluorosis if you have excessive systemic fluoride ingestion and fluoride ingestion greater than one ppm can affect ameloblasts, so it causes a defective enamel matrix and a mottled enamel appearance. Now this is going to be affecting children from their second trimester, week 14 in utero, through eight years old, and that's the period while the teeth are forming, 16 years if you count the wisdom teeth. Now adults are not affected. Tetracycline staining is kind of similar. Tetracycline taken as an antibiotic can also cause intrinsic staining. And it's also going to affect those same children from second trimester or week 14 through eight years old while the teeth are forming. But what's different here is that tetracycline doesn't mess up the enamel. It binds to calcium and gets incorporated into the hydro. Uh, hydroxyapatite crystals in the dentin layer. So fluorosis messes up enamel, tetracycline stains the dentin. And something very important to think about all this stuff with the defects is that the later the disturbance occurs along this development process, the more minor the defect is. Right, We were talking about before with thickening and the bud stage, if something went wrong, we might just not have a tooth at all, or we might end up with an extra tooth or teeth. 
But if it happens a little bit later, well, we might get lucky and just have a little white spot on there. So it depends on when it occurs, how major that ultimate effect will be. So a summary, we have our tooth germ, which includes the enamel organ, dental papilla, and dental follicle. And here are all the cells and cell layers and the materials that will eventually be produced by the cells of these certain layers. So that will be an awesome reference for you, and I, I really hope this has helped you kind of understand the complex but also really cool odontogenesis uh, process. Now, for some other important dates to know, these are approximate calcification dates for the primary teeth. And I've arranged them ideally for the best and easiest memorization for you. And also to know here, cal the calcification of primary tooth roots is normally completed at around three to four years of age. This is talking about the crowns and when they're starting to calcify. Now here's a handy memorization tool that'll really help you remember this info. The central incisors, um, kind of using ortho, -lingual, ortho uh, language here, they're the, the A's we call them, the lateral incisors are the B's, canines are the C's, first, the primary first molars are the D's, and second molars are the E's. Now with that context, if you remember A, D, B, C, E, all you have to remember is you start with 14, that's our lucky number 14 weeks of age in utero, and you just add one number down the rows here. So if you remember A, D, B, C, E, you just have to remember 14 and add one down the row, and that corresponds to the calcification start dates for these primary teeth. So super cool, hope you can remember that and uh, that it can help you remember these calcification dates. Now I have another handy memorization tool that'll help you with the permanent teeth as well. And here I'm also using ortho language, one, the one referring to uh, the central incisors, and then two, three, four, five, six, seven, going down the row. So here is another, uh, it, it's, a little bit more on the approximate side, but this is all you'll need to know for the board exam. So if you can keep this straight, it'll definitely be, uh, hopefully net you a couple of questions. So for this, remember six, one, L2, that's lower two or lower lateral incisors, three, upper two, four, five, seven. If you can remember this, then all you need to know is you start with zero and then you add six for every row. So you go zero, six, 12, 18, 24, 30. And this represents this information in the table. So between this and this, you have a lot of great information. If they asked you anything about calcification dates, you have right there everything that you need to know. So hopefully that's a blessing for you and you can use that to help make studying a little bit easier. Now, after the tooth is developed and calcified, what happens next? Well, it needs to erupt into the mouth, and this is the last thing we'll talk about in the video. Now, I have a separate video covering this, but I really love this memory tool, and I can't help but share it with you guys here, too. I got this from another guy on YouTube, and I think it's a brilliant way to remember eruption sequence for the primary teeth, this in the lowercase nxi, and the permanent teeth, this uppercase main. So these two words or whatever you want to call them are really great to help you remember eruption dates and sequence. So first let's talk about the primary teeth. Now all the eruption times I use are straight from the ADA website. So these numbers here are in months. And there is some discrepancy here but again this is what I really urge you to remember for the board exams because every tooth erupts within a range. Normally, it's within a six-month time period, but for the board exam, it's, it's much more practical, I think, to remember a single number for each tooth rather than a range that they could possibly erupt in. And even more important than the number is the order that these teeth normally erupt in. So how we remember this 
is the word or phrase NXI all in lowercase. And by drawing those three letters one straight to the next, you get the sequence of eruption of the primary teeth. And before I start, uh, I'll just explain this is the, these are the centrals, the laterals, the canines, the first primary molars, and the second primary molars. All right, so if we start right here with this lower central incisor, we draw our lowercase n, we draw our x like this, and then we skip over here and we finish with our i at the end. So after doing that, you'll see that we went straight in order here from six months to 26 months. And if you need a, a additional help remembering the numbers, you can remember we have six, 16, and 26 all ending in six, giving you reference points for this entire sequence. So I think that's really, really cool to be able to draw that out quickly and to write those letters and to have all that information at your disposal in just a few seconds. And next we'll talk about the permanent teeth. So all the eruption times here are again straight from the ADA website, but this time they're all in years. Now these teeth also tend to erupt within a six month window, but again, I would learn a single number for the board exam and focus most importantly on the sequence of eruption. So how we remember this one is the word main, all in uppercase. And by drawing those four letters separately, starting with the I, this will get you the sequence of eruption. So we start, and I, I will uh, show you guys what all these mean. This is the, the central, now our permanent teeth, central incisors, lateral incisors, canines, first premolars, second premolars, first molars, second molars, and we even have the third molars in there. So we start with our I, and we start with the lower first molar, and we draw the I like this. We jump back over to the central incisor, the lower central incisor, and we draw our M, up, down, up, down. All right, and now we jump over here, and our A is a little bit weird. We go up, over, down, and we have to finish our A, so we go up like this, and then we jump over to the lower second molar, and we only have one place to put our N, and it's just like that. So by starting in those areas, we get our sequence of eruption. And I think it's just so cool that there's a, the, a word that goes with it. It's uppercase, which has to do with the permanent teeth. It just works out so well. And um, I'm just really impressed with this method. And I think it's just super, super helpful to know for the board exam. Now, some other general facts that I have listed here that are really great for eruption. Usually mandibular teeth erupt before maxillary teeth. Generally teeth in females erupt earlier than those same teeth in males. And in both males and females, tooth eruption should occur symmetrically in both jaws. So if you have a lower left first premolar that's erupting, that lower right first premolar should also be erupting or within a couple months of erupting. If it's not, then, we, then we're suspecting maybe the tooth is missing or it's impacted or something's going on. And finally, something that I call the two, three rule. And teeth normally erupt with, it, with two thirds of their root having been developed. Then after that point, the root takes about two to three more years after initial eruption to complete its root development. So the two, three rule works for both aspects of the root. The tooth will erupt when two thirds of the root is developed and the root takes about two to three more years after initial eruption to complete developing. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching guys. I really hope you enjoyed learning about tooth development, calcification, and eruption sequences. A lot of high yield stuff in this video and I hope it helped. If you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to Michael Raja, Reb Boyd, Leonella Bunger, David Jaden, Yannet, Nicole, 
Isabella Caldas, Ali Benjdir, Jacob K, and all of my other patrons for their support. You can unlock extras like access to these video slides if you want to take notes on them and practice questions for the board exam. So go check that out. The link is in the description below. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and share it with your friends so more people can learn from Mental Dental. Thanks again for watching everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.